Thanks for choosing us. A leading member of the Fixer Country Movement, Oliver Bakavomawo, has been charged with treason felony. This is an offence provided for in Section 182B of Ghana's Criminal Offences Act, Act 29. This provides sections... Uh, the section 182 treason felony a person is guilty of treason felony and shall be punishable as for first degree felony b prepares who prepares or endeavors to carry out by unlawful means any enterprise which usurps the executive power of the state in any matter of both a public and general nature. Last Thursday, Mr. Vomero took to social media to threaten a coup following pictures emerging from the majority leader's 65th birthday bash showing an e levy designed cake. The judge hearing the matter, Eleanor Barnes, remanded the accused person into police custody, pointing out that the nature and severity of the crime meant the court cannot grant bail. The court also ordered that he should be allowed to see his family and lawyers every day between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. He's expected to reappear on Monday, February 28. Court correspondent Joseph Akable was in court for Joy News. What more do we know about um, Bakavomawa's um, arraignment in court? Hello, Hello. Joseph. I mean, just a short while ago, Aisha. He was remanded into police custody. Uh, this was after charges were leveled against him. Just one charge specifically that has been filed against him, uh, the charge of treason felony. And I am here at the Ashaiman District Court. Uh, the state prosecutor, a police prosecutor specifically, ASP Sylvester Asari, took the court through the basis for the arrest of Mr. Oliver Bakavomawo. Uh, he explains that uh, some time ago, uh, the police received information that uh, Mr. Bakavomawo was intending to incite persons to engage in a coup. And so they said investigation commenced and subsequently they learned that uh, he had been inciting them on social media and so he was picked up. Uh, let me quickly do the interaction with a few of his members of the Fix Their Country conveners who are here with us here. I mean, Raphael, earlier you were telling me about how you feel about all what is happening now? Yeah, uh, it's so frustrating. It is very uh, devastating what is happening in the country now. Ghana is a democratic country. We all admit to that fact. But what is happening now, Ghana is turning to be a banana republic. What is happening now is, 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 is too much, okay? And the youth of Ghana, you can see from the people that Ghana is rising. The youth of this country are saying they are not happy with whatever that is going on. A coup father is the father of the land. And if indeed, a coup father, I call us all as fellow Ghanaians, we have risen. And all we are saying is justice must be served. Coup does not mean you are going to vote against the government. They should go to the constitution, or what they call the dictionary, and check the meaning of coup. He never said he's going to organize a military coup. Oliver Baka is not a, is not a military officer. Yeah. Oliver has never had any military training anywhere. He just made a comment that he is going to organize an EQ. What is EQ, Mr. Baomia? Which comments, Mr. President, haven't you heard in this country? You said it yourself. What is the meaning of all the I be die, Mr. President? What is happening now in this country? Is sending this country in a ditch. And a good father, if you remember the Arab Spring, what you said about the Arab Spring is about to happen. I mean, is that the same for you? How do you feel? How, how do you feel? We are marching straight to the police station. We need to be there. Oliver needs to be granted bail. No crime in this country. Okay? Sorry, message I'm sending man on Mr. Omani. That's a base on that we are calling you to court. I think this is highly frustrated. I see you can also judge it. Thank you very much. I'm presented in court by a uh, respected legal practitioner, Mr. Kutuampao. He made an application for a bill and he specifically accused the police of breaching the constitution by not ensuring that they put Mr. Oliver Bakavomao before court within 48 hours. Uh, we got some explanation from the police. A DSP Sylvester Sari, who led the prosecution team today, did explain that it is the case that on Sunday, when even before the expiration of the 48 hour window, they had made efforts and sent a team to the Chief Justice Office to ensure that they actually had a court that could sit 
and hear the matter within the 48 hours but they proved it proved futile he indicated and so it is on that basis that they had no choice but to arraign him at this morning and so the latest from the Ashaman district court is that Mr. Bakavomawo remains in the custody of the police up until February 28. The court says he reserves the right of making an application at the high court if he deems it necessary to do so Aisha. Uh, Joseph Akable is our man. He's reporting from the Sherman uh, Court and he's been telling us that Baka Vomawo uh, has been. Um, um, Akable, if you're still there, uh, can you describe his demeanor when he was given this sentence or when he was um, charged with this? Hello, Akable. Uh, together with uh, one of the Fix the Country shirts under the knee to the suit. Very calm, he looked pensive. There were points in time that he folded his arms. There was one point in time that he had attempted to say something to the court and the uh, magistrate did indicate that uh, he could not speak at that point in time and that his lawyers were going to address any concern. Specifically, this was at the time that the claim was being made that he was arrested at 10 p.m. on Friday. And so he wanted to speak to correct that impression that he had been arrested on Friday, 10 p.m. Uh, and his lawyers did in fact point out that the arrest was effected sometime around 4 p.m. on Friday. And so it was a look of calmness, pensiveness, and also monitoring what was going on closely. Right after proceedings, he was led out of the courtroom right here on my left-hand side and brought into the waiting police vehicle to be taken into police custody, Aisha. Um, Akable, we are told that he, he's, on, uh, he's on hunger strike. How did he look? Did he look like somebody who's not eating for days? I mean, obviously, I mean, for those of us, and by way of the media landscape and the interactions we've had uh, with Mr. Bakavam, or he doesn't look as um, energetic as we've all, all known him to be on a normal day. I mean, he's quite a vociferous young man. He was a bit uh, calm at this time around and looked very pensive as he was actually brought into the court handcuffed. And when the case was called, the cuffs were taken off, but eventually the, the cuffs were fixed again and he was taken into uh, the waiting van. But we understand from the group and those who are close to him that uh, the hunger strike, uh, he's taking fluids. It's just meals that he's not taking. And it's to register his displeasure at the fact that he believes that his arrest is unlawful and his rights are being uh, breached by uh, the state security apparatus. Legal practitioner Martin Kwebo accused the police of unconstitutionally detaining Oliver Bakavomawa beyond 48 hours. But the director of police uh, public affairs, DCOP Kwesi Furi, says the court should be left to decide. And counter reasons. And let's leave that to the court. But was there a particular reason why the police had to do that? As you are aware, we are in a democratic environment. We are all subject to the dictates of the Constitution, to, and that enjoin us to uphold the values of the Constitution and the constitutional establishment and order. And for such a post, uh, we threaten the very foundation of democracy and the Constitution. Definitely police might come in. Because police are the enforcers of the law. And that is what we did. And we've not taken action for ourselves. But we've gone to court. And I believe that that is the place, a fair ground for all parties, and we should respect that, that we are in court. Uh, this OP, there's a case, the, a Supreme Court case that has given uh, the leeway for courts to sit on weekends and even on holidays. You should have um, arraigned him before court per Article 14.3 on Sunday. Why didn't you do so? We are in court all these things could be considered. Those things could be raised, and we are in court.
Deputy Defense Minister Kofi Amman Kwame says the security agencies are on high alert to deal with any acts that threatens Ghana's peace and stability. He says threats of a coup d'etat should not be encouraged in a democracy when there are disagreements over the government's policies and decisions. He says such pronouncements tend to adversely affect the external image of the country. There's more in the following report. Yen faya huwa den en kokase ye kwa ye ku. Yen ya huwa den ebe suyan sanwa juma. Ami ya ye juma pa. Ama oma gana kwa nani. The Deputy Defense Minister described as worrying threats of a coup d'etat by convener of the Fix the Country Movement, Oliver Baka Vomawo, over the controversial E-Levy debate. Mr. Amankwa Menu says coup mongering has stating effects on growing economies like Ghana. He, however, says there should be no cause for worry. Every Ghanaian living in this country called Ghana to go about their normal duties without any fear because I have so much confidence in our men in uniform. They are prepared to protect this country from, from those I will call the destroyers, the doomsayers, because for them, probably, I don't know what, what really they will seek to benefit from coup. But I believe, I believe in all fairness, that majority of Ghanaians do not want that to happen. Mr. Mankwa Menu is also unhappy with a statement by General Secretary of the NDC, Johnson Esidun Ketia. We want to develop this country, and we can develop this country not through coups. No, we can develop this country by sharing ideas. We can always disagree to agree. We don't have to, to fight. That is why I, I, I thought it was in, in a bad taste when the General Secretary of the NDC said that if they want to make sure that whatever standing orders or the laws we have in Parliament work and, and they have to slap for those laws to work, they will slap. For crying out aloud, Parliament is not a boxing arena and nobody wants to go there and box. We go to Parliament to debate. We go to Parliament to share ideas. It's a place where we always agree or disagree to agree so that we can push the, the country forward. Thank you very much. Director of Public Affairs, uh, DCOP, Kwesi Fori, uh, for the police, he says investigations into the Lama Shegu shooting incident that led to the death of one person will be done swiftly. Seven persons have sustained various degrees of injury during the riot following an initial investigation into the shooting incident at Lama Shegu in Tamale involving the Tamale District Patrol Team. The police administration has interdicted some police officers involved the police attempted to arrest a man who had refused to stop at a police checkpoint the suspect allegedly drove through a police checkpoint and sought refuge at lamashego palace with the police on his heels and firing gunshots at him the youth of the town upon seeing the pelted stones at the police and burnt car ties in the middle of the road the police brought in reinforcements with heavily armed men in water canoes to disperse the visibly angry youth, Chief Superintendent of Police, Georgie Abouafari, is a Tamale Divisional Commander. He says the youth have threatened to burn the Lamashegu Police Station Sunday nights, forcing them to bring in a combined team of military and policemen. When we got there, the crowd was too much. And even my reception was not encouraging, not by the chief and his elders, but by the youth around. Good. I entered and he said, your man was nearly to be lynched, but he has been brought inside. So find a means to take him away. I then called our patrol team, the FBU, to come and they, in fact, they came and then whisked all of us away to the regional police headquarters. At the headquarters, I decided to go to the Tamale Teaching Hospital to look or to see the victim it was alleged was hit by a bullet. I went there and in fact I saw a 24-year-old man 
who was on the sick bed. In fact, according to him, or according to reports earlier on, he had been hit with a bullet in the head. I went there with an investigator, we took pictures of him, and indeed it was a, 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 a bit of confirmed that he had been hit. And doctors were on him, working on him, and he was also responding to treatment. Uh, this night, And to other stories, government has cut short for the construction of the first secondary school in... All right, so uh, we can now listen to DCOP uh, Kwesifori on the Lamashego investigations. First, so what individual roles did the six police officers who have been interdicted play in the Lamashego clash? The reason why you've interdicted them. Hello, DCOP. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for your information, the police carried out an initial preliminary investigation and in line with what service instructions, rules and regulations. But in such a thing occur during our duty tour, it is fair that such persons, officers, uh, should be interdicted and allow full scale investigation. Had the administration been pointed, they've launched a full scale investigation into the issue following the discharge of weapons uh, regarding the six member patrol team from Tamale District Police Headquarters. At the moment, um, the police administration has directed that DCOP, Mr. J, should lead investigations supported by three experienced detectives from the CID headquarters and three other officers from the Police Professional Standard Bureau. And jointly, they might carry out investigations uh, regarding issues bordering on administrative and professional matters, as well as issues that falls within the domain of the CID. And as I speak to you, um, everything is ready, and they will soon commence that investigation. Meanwhile, the regional commander in charge of the northern region Commissioner of Police, Mr. Bonga, has also been asked to liaise with affected families. And have a conversation with the chiefs and opinion leaders in La Mashegu. Northern Regional Correspondent Matena Bugari now joins us on the phone line with more. We understand that Northern Regional Security Committee has ended a meeting with the Chief of Lamashegu over yesterday's disturbance. Matina, what was the outcome of this meeting? Um, the Chief presented a, a petition. He asked that six people who were picked up yesterday be released. He says nothing uh, short of that will he take. He says that these people did nothing. Uh, they were just picked randomly and sent to the police station, and so he's demanding their release. He says that this is not the first time several other events have happened in that same nature, and he thinks that the time has come that this must stop. He says this should be the last that uh, they would make brutalities on the people of the region. But he made a, a passionate appeal, and a visibly angry chief called for a national dialogue on how to how recruitment are being done into the security service. He believes that protocol is destroying the fabric of the city. He says that um, because of protocol, people are unable to discipline people as they should when they go for training because this uh, big man's son or daughter or relative is in the service. And so they come out half big. And he's asking for a national dialogue on this one. He says that it's destroying the profession. 
So has this been done, the request? Um, we are yet to get a response, but the mayor who led the, the uh, chief palace said that um, they would sit at respect and then a decision will be taken on uh, the release of uh, the six that were taken. I must say that the, my, uh, the leader of the NDC in parliament and MP for the area, um, Harun Edwin, who was also at the palace, he also made some um, statements. Uh, he's saying he recounted three events that have happened in the same light, and he's calling for uh, an end to what he described as the tyranny and brutality on the people of the area. And he's calling on government to take up the medical bills of these people who were uh, injured. And he's also calling for uh, a full-scale investigation. He says that he'll present the issue on the floor of parliament. Now, he also made one, and he says it will be revealing for them to find out how these police officers were trained and how long these officers were trained. So these are some of the issues that came up uh, when these two meetings were held at the Peace Palace. But now, I must say that the people are really very angry. Now, if you saw the way they booted and put at the police who escorted the red sex team, it is something that tells you that people are still very angry in the city because of what happened yesterday. Martina Bugri is our Northern Region correspondent. Uh, we'll be bringing you more on this as and when we get updates of what has happened to those who have been arrested. But let's go to Winneba, where tension is brewing on the campus of the University of Education. As uh, some council members accuse the council chairman of taking unilateral decisions, the council chairman is alleged to have written a letter reinstating Professor Avoke without the prior approval of the members of the council. They further accused Professor Avoke and the council chair of reinstating the former director of finance at the university when the court ruling specifically stated that such persons that were affected were to be reinstated to their former grade and not their positions. Richard Kwejonyako now joins us via Zoom. Uh, Richard, what has uh, generated this chaos on campus? Hello, Aisha. Yes, Richard. Um, I'm finding out from you. Uh, give us details of what has led to this chaos on campus of uh, University of Education. So um, there is um, a chronicle of events that have characterized these. So on the 6th of February, the council chairman invited the university management to a meeting with him at the University of Education, Winba, to discuss the roadmap of the implementation of the court order. And so um, when they had that meeting, Professor Avoke was introduced as the new uh, vice chancellor per the court order. According to some of the council members, all of these things, decisions were taken by the chairman of the council alone without even consulting them. And then the letter he wrote uh, on, they said that the letter that was written was not on a certified registrar's copy, but was on a fake letterhead, and they found them circulating on social media even before the management even met to take that decision. And uh, on the 8th of February, we are told that a letter has been written to the current former, uh, the current director of finance to vacate his position, reinstating uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Akoli to his previous position. And this one, they have vehemently disagreed with the council and Professor Avoke because they say that if it is reconciliation and peace that they want on the campus, the council chairman should not be seen doing things without the consultation of other members of the council, and then they should not be dismissing people or taking them off their positions as a result of that. They specifically indicate that the court order specified that the former people that were dismissed ought to be reinstated to their grade and not their positions, but that is contrary to what they are doing and so they want an intervention to halt all of these things that are happening on the university campus. So um, as we speak now, what is the situation on campus? So the situation on campus is that they sense that there is a bigger hand that is um, manipulating the event at the University of Education, Winneba, and not the structure that has been laid like the council of the, the governing council, the management. And so they are saying that if they go ahead 
to relieve the current finance director of his position. And then they have also outlined a number of people that are also going to follow suit, like the registrar and by extension, other senior members of the of the university, which they feel that it is not in the interest of peace because, you know, the University of Education really has gone through a lot. And so they felt that the court's order would have, I mean, calm things, that, but rather things are escalating day by day. And if care is not taken, there would be some riot on campus as a result of this. Kwejonya Akun is a man on this beat. We'll bring you updates on this uh, developing issues. But today is Valentine's Day and it's celebrated annually to affirm love and affection to partners, family and friends. But the season also offers sales opportunities for traders to maximize profits by stocking items in the red flavor. Anita Sewa Ajogan reports chocolates are featuring prominently in the sale of Valentine products in Kumasi. Apart from red clothing, flowers, teddy bears and wine, chocolates are among the favorite items of gifting among Ghanaians and celebrating Valentine's Day. Since 2007, Ghana has celebrated Valentine's Day as National Chocolate Day to promote the consumption of chocolate and other cocoa products among the population. The idea has caught on with Ghanaians as many buy chocolate and other cocoa products for their loved ones. Ajwa Benedicta, a trader, is cashing in on the season by selling chocolates. Chocolates generally The chocolate business is really booming. It was slow last year, but sales this year is good. Other traders say customers often request the inclusion of chocolates in Valentine hampers. All my customers want chocolates included in their hampers. A number of businesses take advantage of the season of love to make good profits from the sale of packaged Valentine gifts. Some businesswomen who spoke to Love Business News say discounted prices on preferred products help increase sales. For Valentine's Day, people prefer that I probably give a 20 or 30 percent discount mm -hmm. rather than a hamper. Then the person chooses what she wants. It's the season of love and I'm right here in the central business district to find out how traders are planning to celebrate Valentine's Day. So join me and let's find out. This is Valentine's Day. Valentine's is for the young folks. I have never celebrated Valentine's Day. We will celebrate the Valentine's Day in the market. And I say race watch be the motor you to buy it for me. I'll collect it because I know and yet force to say ABR for ABM. How are you celebrating Valentine's Day? Well, love is in the air. For Joy News, Anita Sewa Ajuga reporting. Well, happy Valentine's Day. We'll take a break, we'll bring you the very latest from the world of business. <laughs> Hello, welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. The cost of mobile phone repairs and prices of accessories have shot up in Kumase in the Ashanti region. Dealers in phone accessories say high import charges and the depreciation of the CD are factors influencing the increase in prices. Retailers and repairers say they are losing income as users now prefer buying new phones to repairing faulty ones. Here is Lava Fans Mona Lisa from Pong with more in this report. Tola has been repairing phones for more than 10 years. Before Android and iPhones flooded the Ghanaian market, the popular Yam or China phones came in handy. The Yam phone accessories were cheaper, 
But lately, the accessories of Android phones are expensive. Tonla Point are the importers for the persistent increase in phone accessories. Tola has been repairing phones for more than 10 years. Before Android and iPhones flooded the Ghanaian market, the popular Yam or China phones came in handy. The Yam phone accessories were cheaper, but lately the accessories of Android phones are expensive. Tola points are the importers for the persistent increase in phone accessories. Because they say no more, Moko found money back and me at all. I'm so Moko so many processes. Oh, oh, yeah, test with OS in Nana, a Bobuska. This is Canos no more bar. Oh, man, and Count Uncle Abutum. But better go, no man, so my hiding. Yet, yeah, say by one your day. Oh, Moka. Batteries, headsets, holsters, shells. Pouches, screen protectors, drop and shock protectors are few accessories recording increase in prices. This has deterred a lot of people from repairing their phones. Some phone users spoke to Love Business on how the cost of repairing phones have shot up. For instance, I have a phone that costs around 1000 If it spoils and I'm supposed to repair it, around 400 cities. I think if I have used it for a year or two, looking at the value of um, the money I used to uh, bought it, I think I wouldn't go for repairing. The phone, I not crack it. I make not crack And I even 15 cities. We say we are papa pa twenty. We are a year a year okay. We must some take a year more ten. And the price, no. We say twenty. We say fifteen. We say ten. Until you, until the one who invests, no. Now, Iko, every penny, we to have to do one month. Now, sign. Samuel Pra, a dealer in phone accessories, says his suppliers lament depreciation of the city against the dollar. He takes me through the price change of some commonly used accessories over time. For instance, an hands free like OPK, at first I used to sell it at 8 CDs, but now I have to sell it at 12 CDs, else I'm going to run at a loss. Charger like e power, at first it used to be 20, the original ones because we have so many types of e-power chargers. So the original one at first, I used to sell it at 20 CDs. Now I have to sell it at 30 or 25, depending on the customer, depending on the quantity the person is ready to buy. Samuel does not want to lose his customers. He is therefore compelled to adjust prices to attract patrons. When they come, they want to negotiate. And here, if you come and negotiate, you want to bring my business down. So there is no way I, I will also listen to the way you want to negotiate with me. Because if I do that, I'm also going to run at a loss. This situation the businesses have observed has deterred a number of people from repairing their phones. Traders are worried this will cripple their businesses in the coming years. Because we work much, we charge you more money. Maybe a Samsung Gate 20, or Koto screen bear 2.5. All the work much is 50 cities, 300 cities for a screen. Then you know man, what's what? Okay, I'll be. But we can control no appear and be an issue. You see, when the prices increases, some people will, will, will like to wait for some time before they come and patronize. Well, you have heard some of them give reasons why they would choose to repair their phones instead of buying new ones. Though this is a wise decision, but sometimes you just have to get a new phone, especially when your phone model is completely out of date 
or the phone is irreparable or the cost of repairing your cracked screen like mine is higher than buying a new phone. So are you buying a new phone or repairing your phone like mine? From Kumasi for Joy News, Mona Lisa from Porn reporting. We've got the day's latest business news on the marketplace at the top of the hour. Up next, sports. Former managing director of Accra House of Oak, Neil Armstrong Motagbe, says he agrees with the idea of sinking multi million dollar investments into Ghana football. According to him, the nation must see the sport as a strategic area for investment which can earn massive returns into the country's economy. Mr. Antoine Motogbe, who was a guest on last Saturday, Joy Sports Link, which he discussed the value of Ghana's appearance at the FIFA World Cup. Advantage that when the name of Ghana is mentioned, one of the things that come to our mind was not only Coco, but it's what Ghana football. Be. And that, that, the that, of Egypt yeah. and so, uh, mm. Egypt and Co won their seventh or their fifth and sixth and seventh. We were holding the record for, hold, for winning four Cup of Nations. We're falling down in the pecking order. And so I think that a strategic decision needs to be taken, not on like a knee-jerk reaction because of what happened in Cameroon, mm. but strategically, where does Ghana football fit in the national psyche? Where does it fit? So if we took Ghana as a company, it, it, let's say a company, Ghana, Ghana, uh, corporate Ghana limited, where does football sit? In every company, you need to look at your products, you need to look at your brands, which brands could potentially raise the kind of resource that we need would bring value to the company that would would would, 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 it, it would, would ensure that we achieve the successes and objectives that we set as a people. I believe that our football is one of those sources. We need to mm. take a very serious look at it, put it in our strategy for building the state, just like how we look at health, education, um, all the other things, mining, it, agriculture. Let's do something that has to do with uh, tribal football gala and the Zambama tribe are aiming to defend their title. The second edition of the Songo Inter uh, Tribal Gala Tournament, which kickstarts on Monday. The tournament, which is made up of 20 tribes across the country, will assemble later today to compete for an ultimate trophy as they seek to promote peace and unity among Zongo communities. Tournament organizer Awalo Angulu Mahama has been speaking to my colleague Mubarak. Bringing us together, we use that platform to educate our boys in social vices. Also, tell them to be serious in their football, just like what you you asking me to be disciplined. Sometimes people come to and pick some players over there. Last year, like this, some players were picked, went on trials in the local league. Some were picked outside. A guy who played for one of the tribes is now in Malaysia. Another guy who played for the Zabarma was, is now in Dubai. So it's an opportunity for everything. We use it for peace, unity. You know, football brings us together. So when anything about football, you don't see anything about politics. You don't see anything about anything. We are all there, everybody. You could see if it's a tribe, those tribes have NDC, have MPP, have CPP, but they are supporting their <laughs> tribe. So, and it entertains people, even those who don't play, those who watch, it brings us together. So people are praising what we are doing. So How many teams? How many tribes? This year we have 20, because some are not able to raise their teams this time. Some of them who, okay, because it's not easy to raise and look for a, your tribe's player. Yeah, yeah. Because somebody can come from Kaswa, somebody, you see, so when you are not strong and you can't, you can't. So some are not able to raise. So last year we played 22 teams, but this year 20 teams. Yes, some are late. Later they came in, but we've already balloted. So we have 20 teams and we are starting on Monday 14th and we will end on the 23rd. Hey, on, sorry, on the 13th of March. Because 10 teams. They'll play and they'll, they'll, uh, 20 teams will play and we'll, 10 teams will qualify. And we'll pick six best teams, best losers, and add it to the 10. And we'll play 
16 and we'll get it. We don't want, yes, we don't want to be an even number. So with the six best losers, we add it to the 10. Then we play 16, 8, 4, 2, and finish so that we get it accurate. That's your sports for now, but you can head on to myjoyonline.com and read some more sports stories. I am Uftaw Nabila Abdullah. Up next is World News. Good afternoon. Welcome to Showbiz here on Joy News today. Happy Valentine's Day. Let's start with Diana Hamilton's Awake Experience 2022. Patrons who thronged the Paris Dome here in the capital were, lead, uh, were led right into the throne room of God with spirit-filled worship and praise. We have captured all the highlights in the news text report. This year, patrons of Awake Experience with Diana Hamilton were treated with an unforgettable pre-Valentine's Day present in worship and praise with the likes of legendary gospel group Daughters of Glorious Jesus. If a grace. Koda Mami Ajwa And many more. The love of God was manifested throughout their performances. Then came the icing on the cake. Diana Hamilton made sure that the angels of God came down to worship and praise him for his unconditional love and grace. He said, I trusted he who has called me. And, and tonight he's shown himself strong again. Again, I've seen people worship, I've seen people pray. I have prayed with them and it's been amazing and I'm just grateful to God. So what stood out for you at this year's event? Some patrons spoke to Joy News. Um, being on the stage was a dream come true and um, I mean it's everything I've ever dreamed of. Being on stage with or sharing the stage with Diana Hamilton is it's been a dream country, that's all I can say. And Oh my gosh, it was such a blessing. I mean, personally, I was so, so much blessed, you know. Mommy Dinah is a blessing. To the glory of God, we are always happy and humble after we have finished ministration because the Lord has never disappointed us. We had to sing along to our songs and everything. And from ministration, from, from Shea, from Efe, from Daughters, everybody was super on point. We it's been excellent. It's been awesome. And we felt God's presence here. And to be able to fill this auditorium, uh, it, 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 it takes God's Well, on that beautiful note, we end showbiz here on Joy News today. Happy Valentine's Day to you, Aisha. And on that beautiful note, I wish you a happy Valentine's Day too, Lady in Red. Thank you so much, Aisha. And that's I love our, you. <laughs> I love you too, Becky. That's how we wrap up news today. My name is Aisha Prime. For more news, log on to myjohnline.com. You'll get updates of all the developing stories to enjoy the rest of your day.